All right, we are live. Uh, this is uh, episode two of Made of Robots, um, our weekly philosophy of technology reading group. Uh, this week we're going to be reading uh, uh, Arnold Galen's Man in the Age of Technology. It was written in 1957. I think it was translated into English in like 1980s. Uh, so uh, I'm going to use the same uh, sort of strategy of giving a little overview for maybe like 10 minutes, hopefully shorter than that, and then open it up for some general discussions. Hopefully other people show up uh, to discuss with us or leave comments. Um, there's some technology problems that hopefully we'll get started out in the next few episodes, but I'm not too worried about it. Uh, all right, let's talk about Arnold Galen. Uh, so uh, a couple of things to say, uh, just to sort of set the context. So uh, Arnold Galen's writing uh, uh, in Germany, uh, sort of during World War II and sort of post-World War II, he uh, was uh, a, a part of the Nazi party, um, as many German academics were, and he sort of stayed in Germany during the war, and then afterwards he went through the rehabilitation programs uh, that, for instance, Heidegger failed to do. Uh, I imagine in the future, uh, in future episodes, we'll talk about Heidegger, so it's good to get some Nazi philosophers on the table, so uh, it's not too uh, uh, jarring when we hit it in a, uh, with Heidegger later on. Um, uh, but th that said, uh, there, I don't think there's anything um, sort of pro-national uh, socialism in uh, Galen's works. I know on the Wikipedia page on, on Arnold Galen, he's listed under the conservative uh, uh, thinkers and a lot of other people, um, uh, conservative thinkers. Uh, and I, I guess there's some ways in which Galen is a conservative thinker, but uh, his views of technology, I, th I think, are very progressive and especially influenced by the cybernetic, uh, uh, sort of rise of cybernetic science in, in the day. And he's very influenced by the cybernetic science, especially uh, in terms of uh, feedback. Um, Cyberneticists uh, emphasize feedback. I'm going to mute you, John. Oh, right. Um, did you come back? I'm here. Sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. So he's interested in, in feedback uh, from uh, the environment. Uh, he's sort of influenced by the uh, cybernetics uh, uh, research of the day. Um, in particular, he has this view of technology um, as uh, extending human capacities. So, uh, just a little bit more intellectual background. Um, uh, Galen is uh, sometimes grouped with the uh, philosophical anthropologists uh, who uh, try to. Um, use uh, our best anthropology and sort of our science of human, uh, of, of human, humans as biological organisms, sort of evolutionary uh, biology, uh, to understand uh, what humans are and uh, our natures. And so um, philosophical anthropology is this uh, uh, line of thought that goes through uh, Germany um, that uh, looks at human beings uh, at, at uh, uh, as the, in terms of the kind of creature that they are. Um, Galen, in this case, is particularly influenced by Nietzsche. Nietzsche says that man is the underdetermined creature, or is, uh, is not determined by nature. Um, the idea is that uh, nature gives the other animals uh, the tools and the equipment they need to survive. So it gives you know, the bear its uh, claws, and the tiger its teeth, and uh, the birds its wings. And uh, nature, uh, uh, on Nietzsche's view that Galen sort of picks up, um, uh, nature fails to give human beings any particular tools that'll help them uh, cope with their environment. Um, and instead, nature uh, underdetermines a human being so that we're not fit for any particular environment. Uh, so uh, uh, it's left for man to, uh, as Sartre says, for man to invent himself. Um, uh, we have to make up for this deficient, this sort of natural deficiency. We're, we're these kind of weak, vulnerable creatures uh, that have no uh, natural talents except our uh, our uh, thinking, um, and Galen emphasizes a few other uh, fe uh, sort of anatomical features of human beings, uh, in particular our, our opposable thumbs. Uh, uh, throughout this uh, work, uh, Galen emphasizes what he calls the circle of action, which is the fact that we have opposable thumbs that allow us to manipulate objects with fine dexterity, um, and we have it uh, uh, our hands right in front of our eyes so that we can see the results of our manipulations and get feedback and, uh, uh, immediately from that. Um, uh, so, so, so it's this feedback that allows uh, the kind of, uh, the particular kind of environmental manipulations that human beings are capable of and uh, distinguish human beings from other creatures. 
So uh, let me go through the article a little bit and point out just a couple. Of, I think there's really three main points that I want to uh, highlight. Um, th the first is uh, right at the beginning where he talks about the three different ways that technology extends human capacities. Uh, You yeah. want to give a page number for that? Yeah, this is on page three. Um, oh, hey, Matt. How's it going, Matt? Uh, so, uh, so on page three, he talks about three different uh, ways in which human beings have employed tools to help us cope with our environment. So we're under we're, we're underdetermined by nature, and we need to use these technologies in order to make our world suitable for our own lives. And uh, uh, Galen talks about three different ways in which we incorporate tools into this process. Uh, he talks about replacement techniques, uh, strengthening techniques, and facilitation techniques. So sometimes we replace uh, uh, a sort of biological or organic part of our uh, abilities with some other inorganic uh, tool um, that uh, serves the same function. Uh, 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 potentially beyond the uh, uh, the limits of our of our organs. Um, this is related to strengthening techniques. So strengthening techniques are when uh, we uh, uh, not only replace parts, but we enhance them to do more work. Um, so, uh, uh, and f finally, facilitation techniques. I'll give an example after I go through all three. So the facilitation techniques are um, able to uh, relieve the burden, and Galen has this metaphor of uh, sort of offloading the work that is uh, burdened on our biological selves and uh, offloading it onto our technology. So the technology takes up some of the burden for our biological organs. So uh, you might imagine uh, 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 carrying something from one place to another. Um, I can carry things with my hands, but I might uh, create a, a basket, a, a wheelbarrow with uh, a wheel um, that can carry more. It can carry faster over more difficult terrain and so on. Um, and so I've expanded and uh, extended the capabilities I have naturally with this new tool. Uh, uh, so this is another way of talking about the different ways that technology uh, gets incorporated into human behavior, um, sort of similar to Klein. Uh, and uh, again, similar to Klein, uh, Galen makes clear that uh, these principles aren't distinct, but they might all um, coexist within a, a single technological act. So the wheelbarrow uh, is an example of uh, both replacement and facilitation and uh, strengthening techniques. Um, if, if you guys want to jump in and yell or say something as I'm going, please feel free. I'll just say uh, hello. I'm late. Hey, Matt. Yeah. Um, but other than that, um, longer reading one last time. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a long paper. But, uh, it's a, a which I, I'm kind of being um, exaggerating a little bit, I guess, just compared to I was able to read the last one online, so this one I actually had to do my homework for. So, um, but yeah, anyhow, continue. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Good. Um. Uh, I mean, so, yeah, so there's a lot of material in here. Uh, one other thing is I, I don't expect these uh, videos to be thorough, like comprehensive treatments of these texts, but uh, I, I just sort of want to go through a bunch of texts to put some ideas on the table well, to motivate some discussion. Thing, one thing I was interested in when, when I was going through the reading was just, I had never really heard of this guy before, so I don't know if you've already sort of said anything about um, the author and kind of the environment um, that he swam in or, or sort of, I don't know if, if you want to approach it like that where we talk about the uh, author more, I think that might be interesting. Yeah, yeah um, I, 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 said, I said a few things at the beginning, but I, I can, I'm happy to repeat. Um, it was an well, no, I don't... Yeah, yeah, I, think, <laughs> yeah I think that's the one thing, but it's, it's, just, it's just interesting because he talks a bit about like this, the way the um, Germany has sort of has approached technology is different from the United States, um, and it's so... I think that's a that's another that kind of made me think about the way that different cultures might approach technology um, has a huge impact on how that it develops within these cultures. So that was just that was one sort of thing I kind of had caused me to think a little bit. Um, but but yeah, obviously 
Uh, this was like 1940s, so uh, what was happening in Germany around this time, of course, and yeah. Europe in general. <laughs> but yeah, anyhow, let's, we uh, don't need to uh, rehash. Yeah, no, no. Uh, I, I can say I can say a few a few more things. Um, one thing is I, I quoted the the date for this piece wrong in the uh, hangout. Um, uh, this this piece was written in 1957. Um, Galen's sort of more famous piece is is just called Man, and it was written in 1940. Uh, uh, which is which is why I got confused. So this this piece was written post war and post sort of reconciliation. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, chapter from a book, right? Yeah, this is the first uh, chapter of, of this book. It's a it's a longer book than this, but this is just the first chapter. Um, so yeah, so, so as I said, uh, uh, Galen was uh, affiliated with the Nazi Party, as were many uh, sort of German academics at the time. Um, he wasn't really uh, as closely associated with it as someone like Heidegger. Um, um, and after the war, he sort of goes through the whole rehabilitation treatment that a lot of the academics went through. And, and uh, maintained his academic career after after the war. Um, the the one thing I want to I want to say though is that I, I think uh, contemporary discussions of philosophy of technology are really framed around the 20th century and especially World War II, which was this massive uh, and monumental event in human history that uh, 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 that was uh, partly unique because of its technological sophistication. And of course we've had we've had wars since then and so on. But I think a lot of Thinking about technology um, has to do with uh, uh, sort of what happened during World War II, um, and I, I don't think it's it's uh, I don't think we should shy away from that. And so uh, you're going to see a lot of thinkers uh, from Germany and uh, affiliated with the Nazi Party thinking about technology seriously because it was such an important aspect of the way that uh, uh, of the events of the 20th century, let's say. Um, uh, so, 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 I mean, World War II was sort of the first war that was decided by invention that took place during the war, it seems like, right? I mean, like, the outcomes of war have pretty much always been decided by uh, technological innovation, but it, I, I think, as far as I know, World War II was the first time that people were actually having a technological race right in the middle of the fighting and trying to develop um, novel stuff and that that was a viable option, that progress was happening quickly enough. Uh, so technology became a really big focus of World War II, it seems like, in a way that it hadn't been um, in previous conflicts. Um, and, and that focus of technology continues on past the war, through the Cold War and everything, where, uh, I mean, this is where the technology race really starts. So, um, uh, I mean, these are all these are all considerations that made me want to look at Galen sort of early on, because these are all um, really important issues for thinking about technology. Um, um, that said, I think the piece itself um, is really quite simple, and it anticipates a lot of the discussion of uh, extended mind um, uh, and, and sort of just uh, the cybernetic way of looking at uh, technology uh, that I that I like and that I want to focus a lot on. So yeah, that later. term that term he he does use the term cybernetic, and we'll we'll talk on about that later then. But that was interesting. So yeah, anyhow, continue. Yeah, I, I mean, so so. Uh, and that's where I sort of really want to start getting into the piece is, is that he's, uh, Galen is particularly interested in cybernetics and uh, in feedback from the environment. So uh, Galen's whole discussion of human nature comes from, uh, starts with uh, analysis of how we relate to our um, environmental conditions or sort of uh, environmental situation. And uh, uh, Galen's view is that we're underdetermined by nature. So he makes a big deal, for instance, about the long gestation period of human beings that we uh, I think we Matt we might have talked about this at some hangout like a year or so ago. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so, probably. So, so so human beings have uh, an abnormally uh, I'm sorry uh, abnormally short gestation period for creatures of our size. Uh, we stay in the womb uh, relatively uh, 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 for relatively less uh, periods of time than other animals you would expect uh, of our size. A uh, part of this has to do with you know the size of the hips and the fact that we walk upright and so on. Um, but uh, Galen emphasizes the fact that a lot of our development has to do uh, uh, has to take place inside a cultural environment, and that a lot of our um, learning um, is learning to deal with a, a cultural and a technological situation that we simply can't learn in the womb. So uh, Galen will emphasize the fact that if you see you know a, a deer, a deer comes out of the womb and within a uh, you know, a few hours, it's up walking around, and within a few months, right, it's a right. fully it's a fully functioning deer and can do basically all the deer stuff it needs to do, maybe besides reproducing. Uh, but for human beings, it takes like 25 years before they're even worth dealing with as a person. Uh, 
So, uh, uh, and, and, and Galen thinks that this is uh, something that can be explained by the cybernetic perspective, where uh, we're getting shaped by the environments that we're developing in. So, for Galen, technology is a fundamental part of human nature because it's um, it describes the environments in which we're developing and uh, reacting to. Um, he yeah, found a bunch of great quotes at the beginning. Uh, 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 let me find one of these ones. Um, yeah, if by technique we understand the capacities and means by uh, whereby man puts nature to his own service, this is on page four. Um, the capacity means by which man puts nature to his own service by identifying nature's properties and laws in order to exploit them and control uh, their interaction. Then clearly, technique in this nat in this very general sense is part and parcel of man's very essence. Again, uh, says it truly mirrors man, like man himself. It is clever. It represents something intrinsically improbable, and it bears a complex and twisted relationship to nature. Um, that's that's yeah, a point uh, that so I think ahead. is worth coming back to. I don't know if we want to talk about that right now. Um, but that's, I think, that's a line that there's a lot to say about, right? Uh, that that man mirrors technique, and technique mirrors man. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you want to continue giving an overview of the rest of the paper. It it might be useful to employ some of the conceptual machinery that he gives and the rest of it in talking about that. But that's, I think, that's one of the big highlights that there's a tremendous amount to say about. Yeah. Uh... Let me let me just uh, say what I yeah. want to talk about later in the paper, and then maybe we'll get back to this. Um, the other two big things I want to talk about in the paper are uh, about uh, Galen's discussion of automation, which um, he thinks that uh, uh, and he's writing in the 50s again, so he's, he's mostly thinking about like cars, the way that teenagers think about cars. Um, but but he uh, Galen thinks that we have some psychological fascination with automated systems, systems that uh, obey their own rhythms, like another biological system. And so uh, uh, Galen spends a lot of time in the, in the middle of this passage talking about automation, and this leads to uh, a discussion he has at the end of the, pas uh, at the, end of the passage talking about uh, magic, uh, which was one of the other things I wanted to talk about, where Galen uh, has an extended discussion of the role that magic plays in uh, our psychological uh, understanding of the world and how technology sort of systematically replaces this, this sort of magical perspective. Um, so those are the two things I want to get to later, but maybe we should maybe we should start with the discussion of this nature mirroring man. John, I don't know if you want to riff on that. Uh, let's see. So like this is when I when I taught this uh, most recently, which was at Cooper Union. This is one of the things that the kids really seized on. Um, a more general point that I. Uh, I think is interesting is that as I've continued to teach this paper over like the last six or seven years or so, um, it's gotten to the point where successively each class has found this more and more obvious, <laughs> like the kind of stuff that the um, that he's saying in here, which is true I think for a lot of the uh, the material that I've presented in, in the philosophy of technology courses. They're just like, yeah, obviously this stuff is true, um, which is also sort of a, a, a general. Maybe, maybe a generally interesting point. Um, but as far as this one goes, um, let's see. So, uh, what did I want to say? So, I don't, Dan, maybe, maybe something good to talk about would be what uh, mirroring means here. So we're talking about him as an anthropologist, right? Uh, you said earlier that that's studying man um, as a biological organism, but that doesn't seem exactly right. Um, it's, it's studying man as something that has uh, a particular relationship to uh, other agents, right? Um, and that's defined partially in virtue of the fact that uh, it has that kind of social relationship, um, that it's not the kind of thing that stands on its own, um, but that's influenced by where it stands in a larger web of interactions. Um, and, and you might think the same is true of technology in a certain sense, that it's, it's defined not just in virtue of intrinsic stuff, uh, but in virtue of the kinds of interactions that it has and how it influences um, both both upward, right? So uh, influences at higher levels of organization and downward also. Um, it's something that's defined as a result of how it stands in relationship to other things. Um, it's functional. Um, it's not just a, a, a thing in itself uh, in the Heideggerian stuff. Does, does that make sense? Yes, but, but I think that's uh, maybe included in thinking about biology. I mean, if we're thinking about biological, or, I mean, 
uh, I guess the reason I said biological is I wanted to talk about it in terms of evolutionary, sort of an organism adapting to an environment. Um, and I think that's really at the core of what Galen's talking about here, is that, is that the environment matters. And you're absolutely right that it's, it's not just a, a physical environment, but it's a social environment. Uh, well, so you can talk about the environment mattering, though, and, and, and not... Uh, part, of, part of what it means to say that the environment matters is that there's um, some sort of inter-level stuff going on, it seems like. Uh, there's influences on lots of different kinds of organizational schemes. Uh, so, so the technology is not just influencing other artifacts or whatever. Hey, hey, John. Hey, John, your video is cutting out. Like. Yeah. I'll be back. Okay. John lost connection. He will be right back. Um. <clears throat> uh, so, so we were talking about an organism and its environment, part and parcel of man's very essence. Uh, so Galen thinks that in order to understand uh, man, you have to understand the technology that he is immersed in. The um, not just the objects themselves, but the, the whole, in Klein's sense, the whole social system of use, socio-technical system of use. Um, one of the things that Galen points to, to to defend this is uh, the fact that we uh, tend to divide history in terms of technological era. So we talk about uh, the Stone Age and the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, uh, the Information Age, the Industrial Age. These aren't differences in uh, persons or people that lived at those times, these are differences in the technology they use. Uh, something about those cultures uh, are um, understood uh, through the lens of the technology that defines it. So this is why we talk about ourselves in the information age, the digital age. Uh, uh, John's back. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, I set my I set my phone next down uh, down next to my. Uh, the side of my computer, the Wi-Fi card is on, and sometimes it gets grumpy about that. Right. Uh, what? Anything else transpire? I, I yeah, I, I said things, but uh, you can go back to the environment. Y yeah. So, I mean, one one of the ways that you might think that that technology mirrors man um, is in virtue of having this kind of uh, really broad influence of the dynamics between different uh, levels of organization. Um, so, so man. Uh, as a biological agent, um, has different uh, sorts of influences um, than man considered as a social agent. Uh, there, there's both upward and downward causation in this stuff. Uh, and, and likewise, technology, it seems like, is different from uh, everyday sort of mundane objects in that it fits into um, ways of considering the world uh, from lots of different perspectives and has an impact um, that ripples across lots of different uh, ways of organizing the systems of which it's a part. Um, I mean, that's just a place to start. Does that are you follow? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, good. Um. No questions here. OK. Uh, let's see. What else can I say here? Um, uh, go ahead. One thing um, I'm wondering is, do, do either of you know when clothes were invented? It depends on what you mean by clothes. Yeah, I guess, like, did it... I don't know anything about how it worked out as far as it was tied to us becoming hairless or we became hairless because of the... because of inventing coverings and other... You know, we don't... The, the idea of uh, reduced fur... Sort of, we just have what's on the head and a few other places, right? 
So, um, so surely it was a feedback, right? Um, probably one yeah. didn't come before the other, and that's that's part of the point that uh, that I was trying to make there is that um, there there's not a really clear distinction um, between what's happening uh, at the level of um, technology influencing biology versus influencing society versus the biology influencing um, technological stuff. I think later in this paper, uh, Galen talks about uh, the purported difference between science and engineering, and that's another really good example of this. Um, so there's a really popular perception that engineering is applied science in some kind of relevant sense, that uh, scientists are supposed to be figuring out what's going on here, um, and then engineers build the tools that are uh, supposed to assist the scientists in their investigations. Um, but the more you think about that, it seems the, the more that distinction starts to break down. Uh, the kinds of scientific questions that end up getting framed um, and that end up getting investigated are influenced by the sorts of tools that we have access to. Um, and likewise, the, the tools that we build um, and have access to for our scientific investigations are influenced by the kinds of questions that we find interesting, which is partially a feature of, of biology, partially, partially a feature of the way that our societies are organized. Um, so there's lots of kind of rippling interplay between uh, the different ways of looking at it. I, I imagine the same is true for clothes, that um, we, we were a little bit hairless or, or uh, we were a little bit cold uh, and started to cover ourselves up. Um, and there was a, a nice little loop that kept reinforcing itself there um, that made it hard to see what uh, which one was sort of the driving influence. Yeah, I mean, I just think it's it's spot on just just for it's like the kind of primal example of using technology to get in the way of the environment. You know what I mean? To uh, subvert uh, otherwise be happening just whatever however much amount of fur that we that some critters had over time in the past, you know. Um, it's the ultimate you put a shirt on sort of thing. <laughs> like there's the uh, barrier. So, so uh, uh, another thing that comes to mind about the clothes example is uh, part of the framing of your question assumes that clothes serve a uh, single function, namely like keeping you warm. Um, but um, you might think that clothes might have well, started. Well, it's even better, as, right? It's yeah, a it, it might have started, yeah, it might have started as a form of decoration, right. or, like distinguishing who the the chief is, or you know who the fertile females are. Well, that's kind of what I was thinking. So, well, we still arrange our fur. Somewhat, we have a uh, you have the the crazy guys with the uh, mustaches, a twirl, and do all that. Um, but yeah, obviously, clothing is a better platform for culture to 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 get in, and even it, it's so it's not only uh, protection against the elements at that point. You can use it for a development of other things, and it's more it's more useful and versatile than fur. I think that's a good example of. Um, Maybe more magic, magical clothing sort of idea like, or like making ones. <laughs> exactly, that's right. That's what I'm talking about. So, but yeah, it, I know, mean, it's, it's not that it knocks out fur, right? It's that it, it makes fur um, less and less uh, evolutionarily relevant. Um, so the more right. the more covering you have, uh, the less and less it matters whether or not you're covered by um, biological uh, material. Uh, to survive to reproduction, it seems like. I mean, and that can be true even in hot environments because, like, white clothes are really good at re uh, reflecting the sun in the way that your dark hair might not be. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's not that it supplants it, um, which is maybe an interesting way to f uh, to frame some of the distinctions that Galen makes at the beginning there. Uh, it, it's that it sort of just makes it irrelevant. It, it's no longer something that we have to concern ourselves with. Um, a, a, another thought that I have about the clothes is that we tend to have hair patched in places that are um, uh, that we smell badly, and uh, I, I'm not sure if reduction in hair has anything to do with like the fact that we rely less on olfactory sensation. To I, I, I don't know. Like there's there's lots of things going on here. Pubic hair, I think, is yeah. supposed to be have yeah. exactly the opposite. Uh, it's supposed to like trap uh, scent so that it uh, is more discernible. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, I think it's like supposed it's to be a good thing. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> the, the the hair is supposed to increase the surface area so that it 
Yeah, I think that's right. Part. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, but my idea was, was maybe that because we rely less on uh, olfactory issues for, like, meat selection and stuff. I mean, we still do to some extent, but uh, uh, I don't know. So, I mean, the point, then, the point is that... Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Nowadays. Yeah, it, it's, it's all these different uh, technological signaling things. So clothing sort of has supplanted uh, the olfactory stuff. Uh, to signal your worthiness as a mate. I mean, you, you judge people by what they're wearing and whether or not they have, like, a Rolex uh, that shows whether or not they're wealthy and are going to be good at raising offspring, um, rather than trying to judge by their pheromones what their genetic structure is. So, I mean, yeah. is that is that's Which of those definitions is that supposed to uh, fall under, do you think? Like, it's not clear that that... that works for any of them, I don't think. Like, how, how does clothing work for those three accounts that you gave at the beginning of the Hangout? Strengthening, facilitation, and uh, replacement. I mean, in, in some sense, it does it does all those things. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and that's why, that's a point I think that's worth talking about, is that the that hierarchy is not supposed to be exhaustive. Right. Uh, I mean, and that's a, par- a parallel to the thing we talked about last week with the Quine, but... Uh, a lot of things are going to kind of cr- cut across this way of uh, categorizing technology. Right. Um, uh, okay, so I, I think I want to talk about automation next. Um, Sounds good to me. I love the bit where he, he talked about, hey, maybe someday we'll, be, we'll get cars to drive themselves. <laughs> you know? It's like, yes! <laughs> We're living in the future. That's right. Uh, so uh, maybe, I, maybe I need to talk about automation and uh, magic together. So uh, uh, Auto magic. Auto magic. So um, uh, uh, p- part of Gielan's influence here is uh, uh, from psychological considerations. And so one of the things he says is that we have this psychological need um, for uh, stability in our environment, that when things are stable, uh, uh, we're comfortable and we're happy, and when things are not stable, um, when things are sort of uh, random or um, unpredictable or uh, uh, uncertain, uh, we get nervous and we get anxious and it makes things bad. Um, so uh, so Galen tells this story about the development of religion as a response to instability in the environment. So, uh, you know, there's a freak rainstorm and the crops go bad, um, and we need something to explain why this happened, and we appeal to this... Uh, myth that there's some god who has, you know, who wants to take vengeance for me doing whatever, uh, doing some bad thing, um, and that's the reason why, right? And so, uh, and now, now that I have a reason to explain why this event happened, then it's no longer some mystery, but it's something that I can uh, under, not only understand and explain, but I can respond to it. I can, you know, uh, sacrifice a goat to the god to make him not kill my next round of crops or whatever. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's the. It seems to me that that's the prior point, and this is one of the things that I thought was a little, I've always thought is a little weird about this paper, is it's, it seems like the way that he phrases it, he takes explanation as being the, the kind of primary thing, but it strikes me that control is most likely the, the impulse that this uh, kind of structure originated from. Um, pe- people don't care so much about why something happens, at least not at the beginning, um, if they're able to influence it and, and keep it from happening or make it happen. Um, I mean, primate studies seem to, to bear this out, right? The, the thing that you can get um, first uh, in understanding a really complicated phenomenon is, is the ability to control that phenomenon and make it happen by intervening on the environment across a lot of different circumstances. Um, so the, like, the, the study that I have in mind is the uh, shaking the tree uh, to get the fruit to come down. So like, uh, if, if wind blows, right? So you put a bunch of uh, primates in a cage with a tree with apples or whatever the hell they eat um, and push some wind through it uh, and the apples uh, fall down and the primates eat the apples and they like them. Um, But it it turns out that it's really difficult for them to figure out that uh, given that uh, environmental condition, I can shake uh, the tree also um, and make the apples come down. What's relevant is not the wind, uh, but the action that comes about uh, the shaking and they can reproduce that through an intervention. so, I mean, my, my guess there 
and I mean, maybe this is just an extrapolation, I guess, from from that sort of thing, it, it is that their primary interest is not so much in uh, discerning a, the answer to a why question, um, and I would imagine the same is true for er, our early hominid ancestors. Their, their primary interest is in making what they want to happen, happen. And that's what religion is supposed to do for us, right? And, ma and magic also, in general. Uh, it, well, gives, it gives us something to do, yeah. That's for sure. To, and and it, it's something to do that's an intervention. It's, yeah, so it's a, uh, it's a framework for understanding how everything ticks, um, or to some degree. A large part of that is you just do hand waving and say it's beyond control. So that's a nice um, facet of that of that of that framework. But but on uh, on point to to uh, John John's comment on our uh, primate uh, cousins. It's not ex what's that? There's that study with the pigeons, right? That would uh, they would do the thing? They turn around and then press the button and get the in the food. Um, the are you familiar? Yeah, right. So they got their own uh, way of understanding how the world works, and they spin around, and they mm -hmm. get the food, right, or, or whatever. They, um, so, so yeah, I, I think it, it's, it seems to go deeper. You know, the av our avian friends have, have this way of viewing the world as well, I guess, to some degree. Right. It's, it's, it has something to do with uh, a correlation, um, sort of statistical correlation. Uh, yeah, f figuring out what I have to jiggle over here in order to get this thing to happen, right? Uh, but I mean, it, it doesn't. That doesn't seem like providing an explanation. I mean, you, pe I, people say I, like God works in a, in mysterious ways. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, I I I don't think Galen is entirely just interested in the explanatory thing. I mean, uh, for Galen, technology is uh, the way of bringing nature to our own service, and he thinks that magic is is the same way. So it, yeah, so you're right. Um, it's not just. Uh, can I explain it? But can I can I do something about it? Um, uh, Galen doesn't talk about this, but I know Dennett talks about this a lot in uh, uh, his religion book. Um, uh, I forget what the religion book is. Um, uh, yeah, me too. Damn it. <laughs> but uh, but he talks about death um, as uh, a really important impetus for uh, developing religion because you have to do something about the corpse. You can't just leave it sitting around because it'll get people sick. Um, so you have to do something with it. Uh, uh, and breaking so, the spell. Breaking the spell, that's right, that's right. Um, and uh, so yeah, so, so Dan talks a lot about just, just the practical need to do something with a dead body um, is, is part of what generates a lot of these these rituals that uh, not only tell you what's safe to do with it, you know, burying it underground or whatever, uh, but also you know all the, all the things that you have to do to help people you know come to grips with the death and uh, cope with that and so on. Um, uh, so it's the so, ultimate so, sweeping it under the rug. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Six feet under the rug. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, Galen's main uh, example here, and I think it, it speaks to the control issue, is rain dancing. So he thinks that rain dancing is is this way of uh, making something in nature happen. Right? If I do this dance, then it'll rain. Uh, uh, so he so he quotes someone giving a definition of magic. Um, uh, uh, Maurice Pradines calls magic an attempt to. This is on page. I'm sorry. This is on page 12. Uh, Maurice Pradines calls magic an attempt to bring about change to the advantage of men by diverting things from their own path and towards our own service. And Galen says it's easy to see that this definition encompasses both magic and technique proper, technology proper, thus both supernatural and natural technique. So yeah. So Galen says that uh, we have this disposition to explain and control things with the supernatural explanations that appeal to myth and uh, supernatural causes and so on. And what happens is that our, as our science develops and as, as our techniques get stronger, we replace these supernatural techniques which don't work uh, with techniques that actually do work. So the rain dance won't make it rain, but maybe seeding the clouds will. Um, and so we start to trust not in the supernatural explanations, but in the uh, technological well, explanations. Well, I guess we should, we should instead say that uh, the technological uh, explanations work better. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> they still have the broken clock right twice a day or whatever thing. So, but yeah, yeah, yeah I definitely agree with you. And, uh, and, yeah, you and, might and, be... and the technological uh, situations don't all, uh, solutions don't always work. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, that work. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, right. But but we know why to some extent then, right? So I mean, like once start once stuff starts to work fairly reliably, then we start to care about explanation. 
um, because we start to care about how how it all sort of fits together um, and wanting to get we start to want to give a theory um, that links all of the predictions that we're making together. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think the the point that you made, Matt, is is a really good one. That it's not that magic doesn't work; it's that it works um, patchily uh, and unreliably right. in, in in a way that we can't uh, sort of piece together in this way. So like uh, a- animists might have a explanation uh, for why willow bark uh, relieves pain that involves something about the uh, the spirit that that dwells in a willow tree or the the life force that dwells in a willow tree. Um, and and that generates really good predictions that if we boil this down or whatever that we can we can concentrate that spirit. Uh, but the it seems like the difference is that the scientific explanation fits in with a, a lot of or yeah the scientific way of predicting it fits in with a lot of other things that we know about the world and a lot of other uh, patterns that we've noticed about how the world behaves. Uh, so it's it's once we have these sorts of predictions down and we have this big family of things that we think are going to happen. Then, then it, we start to get interested in how it all fits together, right? And, and on, on Galen's story, uh, you might think that uh, because our science works so well, it ends up being a much more stable system of belief uh, and pursuits the psychological need for stability that, that motivated our interest in religion in the first place. And f- from that, you might uh, look at the places where um, religion still provides stable sort of instruction for people. Like, um, uh, again, uh, having the whole procedure of what you do when someone dies um, is a really sort of stabilizing force for people in the grips of a traumatic event of having to deal with the death of someone close to them. Right. So having the the ritual to act through um, uh, sort of explains why the religions sort of stick around uh, even in the face of maybe better explanatory frameworks. Yeah, in that sense, it seems like religions are more stable. Like, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you that the scientific explanations are more, are more stable. It seems like pr- precisely the way in which they're more useful is that they're more open to revision, uh, in virtue of the evidence, right? I mean, uh, I no. mean, uh, I would say in some domains the scientific explanations are more stable. Um, we're pretty confident about how to. Well, this makes me think of. Um... The idea of the the scientific revolutions, right? And I mean, it's a crisis in um, scientific paradigms. There's a tendency for some or both parties to start getting religious about it. So I don't know if that's uh, has any relevance to this, but yeah. there, I, it, it's hard to escape it as a as a person, you know, because uh, it's the same thing where like an atheist might be accused of being religious, right. this idea, you know, <laughs> of uh, of persisting in belief against all odds. Right, and and I think that's part of Galen's point is that the, is that these things are serving psychological needs and not just right. Yeah, I I mean, if the question is simply how do we get this thing done, then there's there's usually no question that uh, the scientific way is going to be the better way, but. Uh, if if it's an issue of how do we get people to be psychologically comfortable with themselves and their environment, then maybe that's a little bit more open for. I mean, ethics also yeah. seems like one one of the the places that at least people tend to think that this is an open question. Yeah. How do how do we get people to behave in a certain way? In a lot well, of maybe, cases, people want to say the religious one is better. Well, maybe now is a good time to talk about cybernetics. In that case. Uh. Yeah. Um. Uh. Just to the extent of how how is that gonna change our behavior? Control. How, you're thinking about. <laughs> well, yeah, in all aspects. Um, you know, I mean, I I guess. Um, what's what's uh, Galen's approach on cybernetics? Was he the first to to use that term, or I have no idea how uh, uh, early. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're cybernetics, but mostly uh, in I the think US. Herbert, I think Herbert Simon coined that. Uh, Ashby, maybe? I don't know. Um, but, I mean, yeah, like, there's there are certainly parallels here, right? I mean, the the feedback thing, I think, is the, the big insight in here that really influenced the cyberneticist stuff. So, like, they, they were interested in how you could incorporate uh, technological system into an organic system in such a way that uh, it would be really smoothly accessible 
um, by the organic system so that it could function as a like relevant extension of the organic system. And I think Galen, one of Galen's big insights here is that the, the thing that's really important there is that there's a really nice, tight, um, uh, easily observable and uh, implementable feedback loop between what the organic system is doing and what the uh, inorganic or technological system is doing. And one of the things that you need to have in order to have a, a, a nice, um, neat integration of organic and inorganic um, is a, a quick uh, information loop between what's happening to both of those. They, they have to be able to talk to each other really, really quickly without very much latency. Um, so like when your iPhone screen stops responding to you, uh, right, it, it, it starts to feel uh, really unnatural and not like you're interacting with a physical environment anymore um, because the feedback isn't there. It's not you're getting a, a mixed signals between what your finger is doing and what the environment is doing in response to you. Damn. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Cybernetics was coined by uh, Norbert uh, Weiner, uh, by the way. Weiner? 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 <laughs> yeah, well, he, thank you. He, 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 he's, he's the big cybernetics guy at MIT. Um, huh. In what year, does it say? Uh, before or after this? 48, so like a decade so before. A little bit before. Huh, that's interesting. Wow, that's a lot earlier than I would have thought. Yeah. It was really big at MIT and some other places in the U.S. in the Bell 50s. Labs. Yeah. That's where Bell Labs was. And then it sort of trickles out. So so he's he's coming at this sort of a little bit later. Mm -hmm. um, but, but still in the 50s, I mean, this is when Herbert Simon and so on are, are yeah. working. Well, I mean, a lot of those people were right around there and working on the same kind of stuff. I mean, this was the first time that, like, as a result of World War II, like we were saying earlier, that technology really started to get rolling in a serious way as, like, a, an explicit force in society, that people were thinking about technology as something that uh, had a, a really significant impact on social structures and on what people were doing, rather than just being something sort of off in the background that you would pick something up and use it as a tool right. and put it down. Something that really per, like permeates just all all strata of society. It's uh, technology influences everything. Um, so uh, so uh, to to talk about the the feedback stuff, I, I want to talk about um, automation. But b before we leave the magic discussion, I, I, there's just one other thing that I want to uh, say about magic, which is which is the Arthur C. Clarke quote. Um, uh, our uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, uh, so there's there's other precedent about relating uh, technology to magic, and uh, uh, the the thing I wanted to contrast was in the Arthur C. Clarke quote: um, "What is magical is our most advanced technology, our sufficiently advanced technology." And I, I just wanted to sort of note the contrast I think with Galen's discussion of magic, where magic is something sort of uh, old and primitive, as opposed to sufficiently advanced. Um, and I don't, I don't know if that's an interesting contrast, or if anyone has anything to say about it, but I just wanted to it's, throw in the Clark quote here. It's potentially worth noting that that was uh, post uh, Galen, which is... The Clark? Mm-hmm. That yeah. was in the 60s. Uh, which means that it was probably influenced by this sort of discussion. Um, bringing these kinds of things together. I mean, and same with cybernetics, right? I think it's interesting because it's sort of this idea that uh, the technology is, is kind of coming around full circle, where early artifacts like the, uh, the uh, Flint Arrowhead or whatever uh, uh, very obviously not magic, um, unless it was blessed or something. I don't know. If you got a lucky one, I don't know. But... But yeah, and then, but now we come to the modern age where um, it's magic again. It's technology, but it seems that the, uh, any su sufficiently advanced technology is indistingu indistinguishable from magic for some people. Mm -hmm. For now, like we have technology right now, it's they're complete black boxes. Uh, you know, most com computers are complete black boxes uh, to the way that people interact with them. Or at least, sort of, you know, no one, no one needs to understand operating system kernels or anything to, uh, to use Facebook. So 
it, it might as well be magic in, in many ways. Um, but there are some people that understand it still and would call it technology. <laughs> I don't know if people would call Facebook magic or anything now, but um, certainly the engineers understand it. It's magic as soon as it ceases to be uh, like a, a taken for granted part of our social structure. I mean, and this is like this is one of the reasons that I th it was good to start with Klein um, and think about like the different ways that a particular piece of technology can be integrated into our practices in everyday life. So, like uh, the key word in the Clark quote is advanced or sufficiently advanced. And so, like the question you should ask is like, how do we decide what counts as sufficiently advanced for a particular culture? So, like right. uh, it, it's the arrowhead might look like magic um, to like our early hominid ancestors, in particular the ma the process of manufacturing an arrowhead, like how, how they know exactly where to hit the uh, stone when they're doing the flint napping um, might look like uh, an incredible amount of foresight um, if you don't know about the, the breaking points and all that kind of stuff. Right, I agree. I think that, but it, it seems that the arrowhead is easier to pick. Up, or there, you might have some um, some brief moment of complete bewilderment as to how you take this rock and you turn it into this sharp, you know, piercing weapon. Um, but you could pick that up probably in a shorter amount of time than it'd take to, you know, be a uh, system engineer to construct these elaborate websites and software and all these things. So, um, which I guess that's just to, to speak on how far this technology has advanced. Um, so that's, I just, that, I don't, I don't know what there's to say about that, I just think that's interesting. It depends on what, a lot on what you're comfortable with. I mean, I'm, like, get, given the environment that I've been raised in and what I've learned, I feel like I, I would be able to pick up, like, systems engineering uh, or system administration a lot more quickly than I'd be able to pick up flint napping. Um, because I, I'm I'm a lot more familiar with the base That's concepts. A good point, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really hard. I've I've seen people doing flint napping, and it really does look kind of magical. They just kind of rotate the stone around and then whack it uh, with something else, and it just drops off. And there's an arrowhead right there. It's it's weird. Um, it's so I mean, again, again, like the the sufficiently advanced um, aspect of this seems like it's a little bit relativized. Uh, so, you know. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Um, just just on that point, I, uh, uh, Galen is specifically not. Uh, he's uh, the philosophical anthropology movement is uh, in some sense a reaction against phenomenology of the sort that Heidegger, Heidegger uh, practice, where Heidegger's approach to technology uh, very much takes into account these differences in perspectives uh, about uh, sort of where I'm coming from and how the technology seems to me as a as a user um, versus the way it might seem to someone else who has a difference history. And Galen's really not worried about those perspectival issues at all. Um, Galen's looking at technology from a sort of uh, big picture systems view and not from a perspective, user perspective view. So, so he's looking at the role the technology plays in the development of a social system, for instance. Uh, and the, the, w the way that it takes place in the development of an individual, but only sort of considered abstractly. Uh, so not in terms of artifacts. I, I, he's, he's thinking about particular artifacts too, but he but he's thinking about technology. I, I mean, this is and this is something I didn't say about the piece already. But he throughout the piece, uh, it's translated in English. Technology is translated as technique, um, and it's, te it's translated te technique partly uh, to emphasize the fact that he's not just talking about the artifacts themselves, but he's talking about their systems of use. Um, uh, so so yeah, so so Gal Galen's not. I don't think he has very much to say about differences in perspectives on particular technological systems. But I think there is a lot to say about that. And so uh, hopefully we get to that um, at some point. Uh, so, okay, so uh, talk little, about automation. Yeah, let me talk about automation. Uh, so this is on page 14. He says that we have a, a pre-rational trans-practical impulse with auto automatic systems, um, systems that are automated. And I think the paradigm that he's thinking about here is the uh, uh, the car engine that sort of runs itself. You need to feed it gas and so on. But but he's imagining like teenagers uh, uh, being fascinated by powerful cars um, and the sort of freedom that it gives them and so on. Um, which they were in the 1950s. Yeah, which, which they absolutely were. Uh, 
the trends practical. So the fascination here with the car and its automation isn't just in the practical, the car can get me from point A to point B, you know, or even uh, that it can get me from point A to point B so fast, but really just as an object, as, a, as, a, uh, as an artifact itself, it fascinates us, and partly because of the, of the way it moves. So um, uh, the, the example he gives of the transpractical uh, fascination with technology um, starts with a discussion of perpetual motion machines, which people are always fascinated by, um, even though they don't actually exist and you can't actually build it and all our physics tells us we can't build it and that it's a sort of fool's uh, 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 pursuit. Um, but nevertheless, uh, uh, people are always interested in um, claims that there are perpetual motion machines or trying out new attempts to make a perpetual motion machine. Um, Galen says that this is completely not a practical investigation. It's not for any uh, practical interest. I mean, if we found a perpetual motion machine, it would be a practical, it would be a great practical tool, but we can't find that, and so there's no, uh, there's no practical uh, drive in this pursuit. It's just a fascination with the automatism itself. Um, uh, and so he thinks the same thing about cars and so on. So uh, the reason he says that we're fascinated by um, automatisms is because they um, uh, show uh, exactly, um, they mirror exactly the structure that we find in ourselves, namely the structure of a, of a, 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 of a self-perpetuating system. So he says that the rhythms of the machine uh, uh, remind us of the rhythms of our own mechanical body, uh, the, the regular be beat of the heart, um, the regular uh, breath. Um, uh, that's another, that's another aspect of the point that technology mirrors man. Mm -hmm. And I mean, they, so like, it's also the case that we, we saw ourselves and our bodies as that kind of thing in virtue of the theory of technology that people were working with at that time. I mean, that's a little bit less in fashion these days, right, to, to think about the body as a, a mechanical system. Is it? Sure, yeah, me mechanism about life is definitely less out of fashion, I mean, especially among people who specialize in that kind of stuff, as, as something that's a, a, a gear uh, and cog kind of thing, but, but just a, all of the individual parts doing what they do um, just constitutes the organism itself, right? Yeah, I mean, sort of. You know that Bechtel explanation? He mm -hmm. thinks that those are mechanical views, but they're mm -hmm. organizational views also. They're sensitive to those kind of things. I mean, I think a lot of biologists, though, don't no longer see it as a, a machine in the sense that Galen would have understood it like a car. You don't mm. agree with that? I mean, feedback mechanisms can be mecha mechanical. Yeah, but there. I mean, there's more than just straight feedback, uh, like there are more sophisticated processes going on that are governing the behavior of the parts, um, not just uh, as a function of what other parts that are um, constituting the larger system are doing. And I, I mean, I think most biologists would say that it, it doesn't just fit together as a matter of, like, you just throw all of these um, things together in a particular arrangement and, and that's what you get. Uh, there, there, there are interlevel explanations and constraints that are operative on uh, biological things. So maybe, I mean, maybe, maybe a different way of thinking about it is that uh, our notion of a machine has evolved, rather than our uh, that our notion of a, a biological system has evolved. It's, it's a become a more functional thing, um, a more functional notion, rather than just a, a notion of uh, parts acting on parts. Um, we've abstracted away from the the exact nature of the constituents. Uh, I, I think that's right. I think there's probably a good episode that we can do of this of just what is a machine and different like definitions of what counts as a machine. Uh, that's a good idea. And, and how that's relevant. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I think for Galen here, um, what he means by machine isn't any particular explanatory thing. Like he's thinking about just the regularity of the heartbeat um, and the comfort that it brings us into, you know, as, as infants. Um, uh, at, at mother's breast or whatever, uh, the comfort of her breath and her the regularity of her heartbeat, um, and uh, these kinds of regu regularities um, sort of signal to us uh, the um, uh, the automatism that's that's characteristic of both human beings as these biological machines um, and our technology itself. So we like 
to see the machines that um, uh, obey these human rhythms. Um, one of the examples I use in my class here is the fact that uh, for any robot that's ever been built ever, um, there's been someone who's made that ro robot dance, to do a little dance. Um, we love seeing robots dance, and we love seeing robots dance partly because it shows the robot um, obeying rhythms that are human rhythms that remind us of uh, are the rhythms that we ourselves uh, sort of take up. Uh, so uh, in this context, um, Galen talks about how our understanding of ourself is always indirect by looking at things that we're not and then comparing it to ourselves. Uh, so uh, finding these automatisms in the machines uh, help us not only understand the machine and also give us sort of control over our environment, but they also help us understand ourselves uh, and give us a sort of a point of reference to understand uh, how uh, we ourselves operate. So uh, in, in history, you see, uh, uh, for instance, the, uh, the watchmaker analogy for the universe, for the cosmos. That the universe is like a watch. And here, we're understanding ourselves in terms of what at the time was a very sophisticated technology, uh, the technology of watch, watch making. Um, and now you constantly see uh, uh, comparisons of ourselves or our brains to computers. And again, that's because our computers are, uh, it's not because our computer, it's not because human brains uh, work particularly like computers so much as the computer is the relevant technology of our day and we're trying to understand, our, understand ourselves through that technology, whatever it happens to be. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit about, or we could talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, automation and autonomy. It, it sounded to me like in a lot of what you were saying there, you were sliding a little bit back and forth um, between those two definitions. Uh, the, you were thinking about um, the reflection of ourselves that we see in automated systems as being uh, a representation of the fact that we take ourselves to be autonomous. Um, and it seems like there's there's an interesting distinction to be made between those no, those two notions, right? Um, uh, not all automated systems are autonomous in the sense that we take ourselves to be autonomous. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah. So um, uh, there's a lot to say about that. Um, uh, when we talk about automation, we're usually talking about uh, lack of outside control. Um, and when we're talking about autonomy, we're usually talking about something stronger than that, which is self-control. Uh, so the the car is is automated because the cylinders will keep firing um, as long as it's running, uh, whether or not anyone does anything with it. Um, and but it's not autonomous because it's not driving around on its own. It's it's lack of a certain kind of outside control, right? I mean, the the car's cylinders will keep firing. Um, unless I start hitting it really hard with a sledgehammer in the right place. Um, I mean, there's a kind of influence. Of gas. Yeah, or it runs out of gas. Um, yeah, if I fail to fill up the gas tank, uh, or if it gets caught in an explosion. Um, so, there, I mean, there are certain kinds of controls that you can exert on automated systems that m make them no longer uh, get stuck in the loop that they're in, right? So, I mean, maybe... I don't know, I just thought of this. Maybe maybe one of the ways to uh, talk about automation is that once something gets started on a, a, a cycle, it stays in that cycle, barring uh, certain kinds of environmental inputs. Um, but automation, or sorry, uh, autonomy doesn't seem like that. Um, uh, autonomous systems aren't in a cycle, right? Uh, I, I... Kind of. I mean... One uh, one thing that seems to be important with this is the ability to react. Um, it seems to it seems to be important for the, both autonomy as well as a, autonomous city <laughs> um, to 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 be able to cycle, be able to for the engine to run, but also um, we'd say it's more autonomous if it seems to be protective of that engine running. Uh, so if it hunts out gasoline and then gets the gasoline, you know, it, it seems to be more autonomous because it's it's tending to, to try to protect and maintain this eternal sort of rhythm. But it seems they're, they're related. Uh, yeah, that, that's good. Um, the mindless okay. rhythms as subsystems for something else maybe... Um, 
kind of it seems to be more powerfully autonomous. Yeah, aut autonomy seems like a certain kind of stability. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I mean, both automation and autonomy, I guess, are, are stability to different uh, environmental inputs. Um, the, the system's able to keep itself from getting knocked off um, into doing something different, from relevantly different from what it was doing before. Um, I mean, so that is... Dan, does that suggest that... Uh, Autonomy is just like a stronger case of automation. Um, is it a difference of degree or is it a difference of kind? You think? Uh, uh, autonomy yeah. requires automation. Hmm. So when I automate my car, I'm increasing my autonomy. Uh. I'm free from having to drive, but I can get where I want at the same time. So I engage that that sort of subsystem, that automation. Car doesn't have a mind yet, but I can use it to to get myself places. Uh, so yes. So uh, I I like the distinction between autonomy and and uh, automation. Um, I think there's a lot to say about it, especially because people talk a lot about autonomous vehicles and autonomous drones and so on. Uh, uh you also see the word uh, auto autopoiesis come up in robotics contexts. Where autopoiesis isn't just isn't just plain autonomy, but it's the even stronger form of self-constitution. Uh, uh, so, so the claim is that there's automation in in the sense that it runs on its own, and then there's autonomy in the sense that it can uh, choose its own goals, and then there's autopoiesis where it const where it can self-constitute its goals. Uh, and auto uh, organic systems are supposed to be autopoetic and um, and autonomous, and so on. Uh, one of the big dis dis distinctions between autonomy and automation, uh, um, this is actually part of my dissertation chapter, uh, has to do with um, nice. the, fact, the fact that automation uh, uh, seems to depend on an on-off distinction. So uh, something can be automated even if I choreograph it entirely before I turn it on. Right? So if I have a robot that has a little auto you know, choreograph sequence, uh, it might be automated while it goes through the sequence, even if I program it all entirely beforehand. So my control only happens when it's offline. And you see this in the robotics literature a lot, talking about uh, well, what, we, what we did offline versus what happens online. And if it can do all the things without intervention online, then it doesn't really matter how much intervention uh, there was in the design, in the offline design. Uh, and this is this is uh, strange because I, I don't think the online offline distinction ports very well over to biological systems because biological systems usually don't go transition between on, online and offline the way technological systems do. Uh, so I think there's a, a really big discussion to have here about autonomy and when a machine can be counted as truly autonomous. Uh, just to go back to Galen, though, I think Galen's talking specifically about uh, automation. Uh, uh, he says he talks about human beings not in terms of being autonomous, but in terms of being an autom uh, automatism. So this is on page 15. He says, uh, and in fact, in a number of quite central aspects of his own nature, man himself is, a, is an automatism. He is heartbeat and breath. He lives in and by a number of meaningful, functioning, uh, rhythmical automatisms. Think of the motion of walking. Think of all the ways in which the hand operates. And then think of the circle of action which goes through the object, the, an, uh, the eye and the hand, and in which, in which returning to the object uh, constitu uh, concludes itself and begins anew. So this is the circle of action, this feedback loop between uh, my hands and my eyes. Um, um, it, it, here he's just, he's just talking about the cyclical rhythms, and he's not talking about autonomy in the stronger sense. I think he's just talking about automation. Uh, and, it's, and it's in this automation that we see our, uh, ourselves mirrored in our technology. Um, when Galen talks about the mirroring of technology, he also talks about it in this complex, twisted way. And this is the last thing I want to say about uh, the thing, and then we should probably end, because I think we're a little over an hour now. Um, but uh, okay. there's, just, there's just this quote at the very end. This is on page 16. Um, he's quoting uh, uh, Walter Rathenau. Rathenau says, uh, Mechanization is not the result of free, conscious deliberation expressing mankind's ethical will. Rather, it grew without being intended or indeed even noticed. In spite of its rational and causal structure, it is a dumb process of nature and not one originating from choice. Uh, so Galen says that technology doesn't originate from choice and it's a dumb process of nature. And I, I want to sort of 
put this up against uh, the view from last time from Klein, which is that technology in the human case is innovative, uh, purposely innovative. So on Klein's view, technology uh, develops in this conscious, deliberate way where we choose the ways that we want to extend our capacities, and then we go through the deliberate process of building and extending our capacities in those ways. On Galen's view, uh, technology is entirely the opposite. Uh, technology doesn't arise from conscious deliberation. There's no goals that we have with technology. Technology is just this thing that we do. I mean, it develops in these uh, uh, chaotic ways that we have no general control of. We might have control over particular things, you know, the next iteration of cell phones or whatever, um, but we don't have control over technology as a general thing. We don't have control over, uh, you know, what uh, cell phones, uh, you know, how cell phones might be shaped and might be popular in the future because we don't have control over all the other things that the technology is going to be responding to. And so it's just this dumb process of nature, uh, more like a hurricane than like a plan of action. Um, I, I think this has to do with the automation stuff also, where it's sort of out of anyone's control. Technology develops in this unguided, uh, sort of natural way. It's a force of nature, like a hurricane. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that part, because it's one of my favorite parts of this essay. It's a force of nature in the same way that um, social systems are supposed to be, right? Um, the, the... Even insofar as we have uh, a certain amount of direct control over the way that uh, our social systems develop. There's there's still a lot of restriction on what sorts of influences we're allowed to uh, exert. Um, so, like in in some sense, the the value of money, for instance, right, is is up to us. Um, but in, in another sense, it's not really. Um, I can't decide to uh, just stop treating um, the dollar bills as if they're worth something and have that actually uh, exert some sort of discernible influence. Uh, nor can any um, subset of individuals that are part of society. There's there's action in both directions. That was And that was the point that I was bringing up right at the beginning. I mean, you get some bankers together, and they can probably do some damage to the dollar value. But. They could do some damage to it, um, to the value, but but not to whether or not it's valuable um, in general, right? Not to whether, and certainly not to money. Yeah. Um, they can do damage to particular currencies, but not to money. Maybe a, a, a less difficult case is the case of Facebook. So Matt said earlier that he guesses the Facebook engineers have a pretty good idea of how Facebook works. They have a pretty good idea of how some of Facebook works, but they're not probably all not... Of it. Right. Yeah, not only all, all of it in terms of the technical thing, but in terms of how Facebook is going to develop in the next five years. I don't think anyone has a good idea of that. Uh, uh, or the next 15 years, or if Facebook is even going to be around in the next 15 years. I don't think we even have theories on the ground that will help us make predictions of those sorts. And that says something about how well we understand these processes. Um, even though uh, we understand how they work at a technical level, um, we have uh, very little understanding of them as large social phenomena. And so, so in this way, Facebook is also a kind of force of nature. Um, and I mean, I think that they're both these both of these point of views, of course, have some value, some stake. You got uh, muted there. You got my uh, daughter. Aww. All right. Go. <laughs> um, <laughs> so beyond the fact that the um, we have force of nature type of type of technology developing, and we have purposeful, intentional, uh, grasping the future and pulling it forward kind of technology. Like Larry Page talks about being a tech, right? A technologist, right? This idea. Of of using technology to improve everyone's lives and all these things. Right. Um, but at the same time, we have the free hand of the market, and they're not going to, you know, it's, it's, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> not talk. All right. Hello, larval human. Yeah, I mean, you have control over the small moves. Um, like, and I, that's one of the ways in which, like, technology is a social system in the, the last sense of coin is uh, really interesting, and that's why something like the anthropological approach that Galen's doing here um, is relevant, that even if we have control over little tiny design moves, we might not have control over the trajectory of the uh, technological system as a whole, because we can't uh, really say what the uh, other kinds of influences that are going to be acting on uh, 
design goals. Um, right. I mean, we might we might say that we have some control over trying to guide it, but it's like trying to guide an economy or trying to 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 guide the free market or whatever. It seems to be different. Yeah. Right. And it certainly has a mind of its own to a lot to to a large degree. Which is just to say that there are some influences on how it develops that are are not inside of our control. Um, so one of the things that influences how an economy works is the the kinds of interventions that we might do on purpose. Um, but there are lots of other things too that that we don't have um, the ability to influence directly, and and that might actually stem out of the result of our or stem out of our trying to implement the kinds of designed uh, programs that we come up with. Um, blowback, right? We might get a lot of unintended consequences that are not discernible before we try to do this sort of stuff. The road to hell. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems right. I mean, this, this is characteristic of a lot of complex systems in general. And, like, it, it highlights the fact that technology is a part of our social structure. Uh... Good. Um, so I think I'm. I think I'm going to call it, and uh, the end now, since we're over an hour. Um, I, I just want to ask you guys if you had any thoughts about what we might do next time. Um, if there's anything in particular you want to talk about, I, I know a pa I know a particular paper on autonomy and robotics that might be a good follow up on the discussion we had today. But there's other stuff also. Uh, I think Aristotle would be useful to read. I was also thinking of maybe the. Introduction to Clark's Natural Born Cyborgs would be a good next step after this. But I don't know if you guys have any thoughts. Ooh, Aristotle. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I like that idea of going back pretty, you know, going back as far as we can to to talk about technology from the origins. That seems to be um, reasonable. So I got one fuck Aristotle and one that sounds reasonable. So yeah, we'll have to just we'll have a philosophy fist fight <laughs> through the internet, John. Yeah, um, I think we can do I, that. Um, but but yeah, I, I'm up. Fight. Right, I'm a, I'm up for anything. Although it does it does, I get I get um I'm available at my computer sometimes not at six like today, so I don't know if there's any way of rescheduling, um, not to be put a cramp in anybody's style, but. Um, like an hour later. Yeah, that would that would probably help ensure I get a bit more of a breather. Okay. Um, and that would be that's fine with me. But yeah, but yeah. Other than that, I'll I'll talk about whatever. Cool. Cool. Okay. So then, Aristotle next time. All right. Well, oh, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> I win the fifth fight, I guess. That happened, <laughs> it happened telepathically. Okay. <laughs> All right, All right, thanks guys. That was fun. Awesome. Yeah. Good times. Great Catch night. You later. Yeah.